Good afternoon and welcome to NEETEC's 19 COVID-19 webinar series. Today's webinar is going to be focusing on infection control precautions in dentistry during this pandemic. My name is Amanda Grindle. I'm a faculty member of NEETEC and today I'm going to be moderating this webinar. After I give you a brief um, information about NEETEC, we will get into today's webinar with two wonderful speakers, Eve and Jill. I will let them introduce themselves uh, when we start their portion. After that, I will come back on and explain some of NETEC's resources we have to offer you, and then again have questions and answers if there's time. For those of you who are not familiar with NETEC, we are the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center. We are funded in order to increase the capability of the U.S. public health and healthcare systems to safely and effectively manage individuals with suspect suspected and confirmed special pathogens. If you have not visited our website, we have a very robust website at www.netech.org. We also have a kind of ask a question feature as well, or if you need more information, you're more than welcome to email us at info at and one of our subject matter experts will get back to you shortly. NETEC, just a brief overview of the things that we can offer you. We have a large branch called an assessment branch where we are able to offer self-assessments and metrics um, that help you kind of establish the preparedness level of your current institution. We are able to do on-site assessments um, as well. Um, right now, most of it is virtual due to the pandemic. We are able to have a robust education branch with online trainings, in-person courses, as those do and do not allow within the pandemic. And then we are doing a lot of webinars like this one that are COVID-19 focused today. We also have technical assistance that can be on-site or remote that give you guidance on certain areas of your program, certain questions um, or meetings that you would like us to be present at. We also do have a robust online repository of lots of tools and resources for you. We have many exercise templates that are based on the HSEAT model that are very customizable for your institution. And then we also are able to provide an emergency on-call mobilization system. We also have a research network that is also part of that online repository. We also develop policies, procedures, and are able to capture data to facilitate research. And then we also keep a specimen biorepository as well. All of these do interface with each other and support each other as well. So again, today's webinar is gonna be on infection control precautions in dentistry during COVID-19 pandemic. Again, I'm gonna let Eve and Jill take it from here and um, introduce themselves before they get started. Eve and Jill. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here for this webinar. My name is Eve Cuny. I'm at the University of the Pacific School of Dentistry in San Francisco, California, where I'm the Director of Environmental Health and Safety, Associate Professor in the Department of Diagnostic Sciences and the Assistant Dean for Global Relations. I'd like to invite Jill to um, introduce herself before we get started on the content. Thanks, Eve. My name is Jill Morgan. I'm a critical care nurse here in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm also working, uh, been doing clinical care here, working with NETEC, caring for our Ebola patients, and now working in the clinical research for better and safer practices at the bedside, especially involving personal protective equipment. So thank you. I just want to start by pointing out that the CDC has issued interim guidelines for infection prevention and control for dental settings during the COVID-19 response. This has already been updated a couple of times, the last update being June 17th of this year. I would, I would recommend to anybody working in the dental um, field to check back to the, the CDC website frequently to ensure that you have um, information that is the latest and most current. Another useful uh, uh, resource to review is the CDC framework for healthcare systems providing non-COVID-19 care during the COVID-19 pandemic. This applies uh, very well to dental facilities, especially those of us who had shut down for a few months during the spring of this year. And it provides guidance on how to, uh, to provide care to our patients in the safest way possible as we start to ramp back up and treat patients beyond those that are just emergency and urgent care only. Some of the key recommendations that are made are the implementation of telehealth to supplement your care to your patients and to follow all the infection prevention recommendations 
in particular these interim guidelines, which are different than what we were used to before COVID-19. Consider that your services may need to expand gradually if you have been shut down, and you should be keeping track of the local epidemiology, which is accessible through your state and county public health department websites. Think about prioritizing procedures that may cause harm if they're further delayed, if you are um, uh, reducing the amount of care that you provide, and then prioritize at-risk patients that would benefit the most from care. Many of you may be familiar with this OSHA risk pyramid. Early on in the pandemic, OSHA through the Department of Labor issued a guide to businesses during the COVID-19 pandemic, and that included an evaluation of risk for different types of professions and industries. And uh, it was highly publicized to dentistry that we were in the very high risk category, both for dentists and dental hygienists. However, you need to look at the spectrum of what we do in a dental setting to understand this risk pyramid. The very high risk procedures are those aerosol generating procedures performed on known or suspected COVID-19 patients. In general, in dentistry, it's recommended that if a patient is known or suspected to have COVID-19, that you delay dental treatment until they've recovered. And if treatment can't be delayed, um, contact a local hospital to see if they have the ability to treat emergency patients. High risk, um, high risk category procedures are those aerosol generating procedures performed on well patients and any other procedure on a COVID-19 patient. And finally, the medium risk or urgent or emergency care where you're not using any aerosols and low risk or administrative duties such as front desk and um, clerical personnel. Another useful resource from OSHA is this hierarchy of controls to think about implementing the control measures that we need to do um, at all times and including those for COVID-19. It's a layering effect with some of the um, controls being more effective than others. Obviously, if you can completely eliminate a hazard by removing it, that is gonna be the most effective. That's not possible in healthcare. We, we are not going to be eliminating our patients, except during times when critically we're asked to shut down. Um, substitution is also not something that we can generally do in dentistry because we can't replace the hazard. So we focus on engineering controls, administrative controls, and personal protective equipment. Engineering controls are things that we do that isolate the people from the hazard. Some examples of that um, during the COVID-19 pandemic are um, enhancing your HVAC or um, heating, ventilation, and air con um, con conditioning filtration by using a higher level filter that will filter out smar smaller particles. Some people have used uh, supplemental HEPA uh, ventilation or filtration, and increasing the air exchanges per hour, also known as ACH. You can also place patients near return vents for aerosol generating procedures, and a return vent is where the air is exhausted out rather than being brought in. Administrative controls change the way that people work, either through um, uh, rules, workplace rules and policies, um, or through altering the way that you perform a, a specific task to make it safer. Some of the uh, recommendations, some of the recommendations for administrative controls include limiting personnel in the treatment room, altering the patient schedule. Maybe you'll see fewer patients per day and you can spread them out a little further to prevent patients from having contact with each other in waiting rooms. Use of hand instruments instead of ultrasonic scalers for scaling and root planing. And then prioritizing the most urgent treatment. And finally, the area where we'll spend most of the time today is around personal protective equipment. This is where the uh, most significant changes have been made in terms of guidelines and recommendations for dental care. The PPE that's being recommended would include an isolation gown, a face shield or goggles to protect the eyes, a surgical mask or respirator. And when we talk about respirator, we're talking about N95 or higher type respirators. And exam gloves or surgical gloves, depending on the type of procedure you'll be doing. Next slide, and I'll turn it over to Jill for the next section. Thanks, Eve. So with that introduction, we're gonna talk about sort of the practice all the way from the waiting room and screening 
clients uh, through the actual procedures you might in, undertake while you're taking care of your clients. So how do we prep a waiting room? Well, I think the very first thing we want to do is say, let's not use it. Let's not use it if we can avoid it. We also don't want to tempt people to use it, to uh, tempt them to have their uh, kids in it. We are discouraging people from bringing family members with them during their visits to a dental clinic. So removing toys, books, magazines, anything really that cannot be cleaned or wiped. Removing or securely covering non-wipeable furniture. Uh, making spaces so that if you do have people waiting, they're not sitting next to each other. And you have a lot of options for how to best bring pay, uh, clients in when you're ready for them. You can text them or call them uh, when, from the parking lot to come in when you're ready, when you have that actual uh, chair ready. You can utilize a doorbell with instructions to ring and wait outside. Sometimes, uh, depending on the size of your community, staff can call and text clients when you're actually ready and have them come in then. And again, making it very clear from the outset what your expectations are, the number of people that could be with them, and how that will be handled once they arrive at your facility. You also want to create a jobs list for scheduled cleaning of these waiting areas, high-touch services. Any doorknob, door frame, countertop that clients might be encountering needs to have a schedule for cleaning. So a lot of the surfaces that we think about in the waiting rooms, we have worked for years to make more welcoming and friendlier, really are not designed for repeated wiping. So we know that some of the cleaners that are very effective can actually eat away at the furnishings uh, when they're, especially when they're being rubbed with a cleaning cloth time and time again throughout the day. So just be very, very careful about not creating splinters that then can be a hazard to your staff. So thinking about how you would screen your clients. So what screening will occur and where will it occur? What kind of questions do you want to ask? Certainly we see guidance from the CDC about fever, cough, shortness of breath, GI symptoms, including nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, which seem to be more common with this virus than with some of the other respiratory pathogens we've had in the past. And then this mysterious uh, sort of interesting loss or change in taste or smell. But it's important to understand that some people with dental problems may have some of those very same symptoms that are not COVID-related, headache, fever, changes in their taste, changes in their smell because of the processes that are going on in their mouths. Think about whether you need to keep these screenings, whether you want them for your practice or not. How will you be able to trace someone back if, in fact, a week later or five days later or three days later after they are in your office, that they end up being positive. Will you be able to go back and figure out who was there at that time? And what are our plans, for, what plans are in place for those clients who do screen positive? If you're able to just defer their treatment, then that's certainly an option. And if you're not, as Eve said, do you have a relationship with a local facility that might be able to handle something that could be considered a dental emergency? I'll pick this back up. This is Eve again. Also think about your workspace um, planning. Look at workflow. Is it possible to minimize cross traffic? Um, if you, depending on your layout, can you map out a single directional pedestrian flow so that people don't have to walk back and forth in front of each other or close to each other or minimize it as much as possible? Also look at the different zones in the in the setting. If it's a small office space setting, you might have um, a private office and a reception room and a waiting room that are lower risk than the dental treatment rooms. And think about how you're gonna manage each one of those based on the level of risk. Each workspace should include a spot for donning, doffing, and storage of PPE. And again, this is going to be different according to your facility type and the layout, but you should look at that and see if you can designate a place preferably just outside the treatment room where somebody can put on their PPE, take it off, and where you can cleanly store your supplies of PPE. Alternate your patients and the chair spaces to allow for cleaning and decontamination time. And especially if you have spaces that 
um, where chairs are next to each other and there aren't walls or other types of barriers, you may need to alternate the use of those chairs and not have all of them occupied at the same time. Because remember, the patients won't have a mask or face covering on while they're being treated. And if they're too close to another patient who's also being treated, you could potentially cross-contaminate. Again, look at your um, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, and also your airflow. Figure out where your um, intake and outflows are. You can just use a tissue, holding it up next to a vent to see whether it's pulling the tissue towards the vent or pushing it away. And if it's an area where there's outflow, where it's pushing, pulling the tissue towards the vent, that would be the ideal place to position the patient so that air doesn't flow from patient care areas to non-patient care areas, also potentially drawing contamination into areas um, that are being occupied by non-clinical personnel. If it's possible, especially in larger facilities, um, you may be able to increase your air exchanges and you can mix in outside air if it's possible, if your facility has windows. You can upgrade your filter on your HVAC system. Filters are um, uh, designated what's called a MERV rating. And the higher the MERV rating, the smaller particles that those filters will um, capture as, they, uh, as the air passes through them. Make sure that your staff spaces and supply areas, um, you know, staff spaces would be things like break rooms um, and uh, uh, receptionist areas where there's non-patient care going on that those are clean and kept clean to the greatest extent possible. And remember now that we have shared spaces such as break rooms where multiple people may be eating, um, you know, and uh, doing other non-clinical duties, we may need to clean and disinfect those spaces more frequently than we did in the past. Um, you can also think about supplemental ventilation as an option, such as freestanding uh, HEPA filter units that'll supplement your ventilation. And look at your workspaces, again, break rooms and shared offices and registra registration and receptionist spaces probably need to be cleaned and disinfected a little bit more frequently. Also, you may have um, taken lunch at the same time in the past with the entire team sitting in a break room eating together. Since you have to remove your face coverings or masks to eat and drink, that should be done um, individually now instead. And think about staggered schedule. Things are looking different just for now. And if space allows for the staff to have their own space, if, such as an own office with a door, or they're sufficiently isolated from others, they can take off their mask. And, and again, in case they have to eat lunch or, or have a drink, then they can be in that space and take a break from wearing a mask. And remember supply and storage rooms, in order to keep them free of contamination, they should only be entered or accessed by staff who are clean, and that means that they're wearing a clean mask and they either have a clean hands, so they've just performed hand hygiene, or they're wearing clean gloves that haven't touched other spaces and haven't been used during patient care. And in your, and in your exam spaces and treatment rooms, try to alternate the use of spaces that'll allow you uh, more time for cleaning and ensuring that the disinfectant has uh, ample time to dry before the next patient is brought into that room. And again, if you're in a space that doesn't have walls or doors or other barriers and the chairs are in the same shared open space, you may need to um, uh, reduce the number of patients that you see in a given day so that you can uh, not use every chair and alternate those. And as always, this is uh, not a new recommendation, but it's even more important now than ever to make sure that the clinical treatment room is easily cleaned. And that means don't have things out on the counter except the supplies and equipment that you need for that specific patient. Everything else should be kept in a clean uh, storage area or cabinet. And if you have curtains on your windows, um, it's um, better to remove those, or if you can't remove them, treat them as contaminated and don't contact them with either your, your clean hands or your gloves that are used for patient care. And we not only need to screen patients, but staff, all staff, need to be screened before they come to work each day. They can self-report their symptoms that would prevent them from coming to work, and they do that before they arrive. So you can do it in a number of ways. Perhaps you have um, an app, an application that can be used on a smartphone, tablet, or even web-based. If you don't, you can use 
paper, you know, use a paper checklist. But I think you do need to go through that process of looking at those symptoms every day and checking them off either electronically or, or, or manually on paper before coming to work. And if there is a concern about a symptom, say a, a, somebody has a, a fever um, and a headache that they didn't have the day before, they need to call in and discuss uh, whether or not the symptoms should keep them home for a while. And then when they come to work, do the screening again, asking about symptoms and then checking for temperature. And of course, we want to practice source control at all time. We know how important this is. So beyond just wearing the PPE during patient care, staff need to wear masks, even if they're cloth masks, at all times when they're in the in the um, dental setting, except of course when you're eating or drinking and then you want to be away from other people and outside of the patient care areas. Think about too the risks that staff may have. Um, if you have staff who are in a higher risk category due to their age or medical condition, um, try to prioritize them to patients who are at the lower end of the risk, uh, risk spectrum to, to help prevent them from becoming ill. And consider maintaining a searchable database of staff members in contact with specific clients. I think this is especially true in larger clinical settings or in organizations such as DSOs that if somebody comes in as a patient and they call you a couple of days later or a few days later um, to let you know that they've been diagnosed with COVID-19 and it was likely that they were infected at the time of their dental appointment, it would be important to be able to identify who, who in the practice had contact with that patient, and then you can interview those people to make sure that they were following all appropriate precautions at the time that patient was um, in the office and may have had contact with those individuals. Uh, next slide, and I'll turn this over to Jill again. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's interesting to see where we all are going to fit into the public health uh, contact tracing as hopefully we get our hands around this epidemic and knowing that we might be uh, responsible for some of that information that we can relay to public health professionals. I want to talk a little bit about the, P, or the sort of the preparation we make before we don or put on our PPE. Any kind of respiratory protection, you want to make sure you're putting that on in a clean space. And we know that in this situation, we may actually be changing from the cloth mask that we wear in our, you know, as we're coming out of the parking lot and into the clinic, we may be changing that and putting on a, a medical or surgical mask, or if you have access to the an N95. So you want to make sure you're put, doing that in a clean space. So you're going to gather your equipment, you're going to perform hand sanitizing. I just can't emphasize how important just hand hygiene is in all, every step of this. I, I know that it, it, we all sound like your mother these days, but it's true. Washing your hands, performing hand hygiene, having a good technique with that, being thorough, and making sure that you're rubbing hand sanitizer until it's dry. And I am certainly one of the people who would stand with hand sanitizer and instead of rubbing, I would sort of flap my hands to try to get it to dry faster because I'm perpetually in a hurry. And that's not correct. We want to make sure that we're covering our hands well and then rubbing that until it's dry. Uh, getting, again, a good contact time, getting good coverage, and ensuring that we're getting the, the most out of that uh, application. Tying long hair back, making sure that you can secure things away from your face and eyes. You know, our eyes are incredibly sensitive. Our noses are incredibly sensitive. And so single hairs that get in your face can be really aggravating. And what's going to happen next is you're going to want to reach up and move those things out of the way. And unfortunately, there's just not a safe way to do that uh, without stopping and performing some hand hygiene. So we don't want you to be tempted to move that later. So go ahead and secure your face, your, your hair away from your face, secure your eyeglasses so they don't slide down your nose, and then any jewelry that might be a hazard to your PPE. A lot of us haven't had to think about that before, but if you have a ring or a watch or something that, that might have some edges that's going to catch on your gloves, go ahead and remove that now so that you can safely and, and not have to worry about the PPE that you put on uh, throughout the day. So I want to talk for just a second about the differences in masks. So when we think about uh, procedure or surgical masks. We're talking about uh, something that looks like here, what you see on the screen, typically with some sort of fold or pleat. And these really are uh, 
judged by the FDA, and we'll talk a little bit about how they're uh, evaluated. But um, uh, one thing that I've seen lately, some of these masks that we're able to purchase now are not perhaps what we're used to using. Uh, a lot of people think that they're, they've gotten used to which color goes inside or outside, and they don't really pay much attention to the rest. But we know we might be using alternate products. So I just want to point out that the pleats on the front of a mask are meant to have what they call a cascading waterfall effect. In other words, anything that might be splashed on that is not going to get stuck in a fold, but will roll down and off. And that's important, right? We don't want it sitting there and then us moving air in and out through uh, the mask fabric past it. So if you put your mask on inside out or with the, with the inside on the outside, then you'll see that those pleats are actually upside down. So the surgical masks that we use, the medical masks, procedure masks that we use are actually rated according to bacterial filtration, particle filtration, and bacterial also includes, uh, we have viral filtration as well. They also are judged for something called delta P, which is the airflow resistance across the filter. So uh, you sometimes will hear about people creating masks at home or out of cloth masks and adding some filtering material. And of course, we know that if you make a filter too difficult to breathe through, you're going to end up pulling more air around the filter. So it's a, definitely a balance of getting good uh, filtration by not reducing uh, the airflow so much that you increase work of breathing or that you make it more likely that air is going to leak around the mask. And then masks have a rating of one through three for levels of fluid resistance. And this is the ability to repel synthetic blood under different pressures. So we all have had situations where something got sprayed at us that we were not expecting. That's uh, disconcerting at best, but you wanna make sure that you're wearing a mask that's commensurate with that risk poss possibility. If you're able to use an N95, uh, that is a, a respirator. So that is a tight fitting respirator. These should be fit tested, although right now there is an emergency authorization to forego annual fit testing. But tight fitting respirators are meant to have all of your air coming through that filtering material. They have to seal tightly to your face. And we do see some being used right now that have this uh, exhalation valve, what you see with that red arrow. Those little plastic valves, those are great for when you're using an N95 for painting or dusting or spraying something at your house that's non-medical, not a threatening environment to yourself because they make the work of breathing easier when you're wearing a tight-fitting respirator. That exhalation valve, however, is unfiltered, which means that it cannot be used as a source control mask. So in this situation with the current epidemic as we have it right now, our masks are serving dual purpose. They're protecting ourselves from our patients, from the people we're around. When we're using them as PPE, we're using them to protect ourselves. So source control protects others, PPE protects the person. The first, PP, the first P in PPE is personal protective device. So if you're using this um, N95 with an exhalation valve, it's protecting you, but it won't be protecting the people around you. And N95 respirators are not just tight sieves. And I think that's what uh, a mistake a lot of people think. It's just a tight filtering material and, and, and therefore um, that's the way it works. It's actually based on several different properties, but it's important to understand that this filtering material is going to attract and trap pathogens. And therefore, if we're wearing an N95, we want to make sure that, and that it might be contaminated, that we don't want to come in contact with the outside. We don't contaminate our gloves with the outside of that respirator. So electrostatic attraction, diffusion, interception, and inertial impaction are all methods the mask fibers use to hold on to those particular particles. So these tight-fitting respirators need to make a seal between our face and the respirator. And we need to perform, whether you've had an annual fit test or not, you need to perform a user seal check every single time you put one of these on. And certainly we see them in use all around 
grocery stores, Target, you see people with an N95 on, and you can see that it's not fitting their face correctly. And we know that a poorly fitting N95 probably has about the same protection as a general surgical or procedure mask. So if you want to get the full protection out of an N95, you need to do a user seal check. You do that by placing your hands on the respirator, sealing it around your face, and then taking a breath in to make sure that you, the mask deforms slightly. And then by exhaling gently and making sure that you don't get leaking around your eyes, chin, or cheeks. So that should be done before you enter a patient care or client environment each time you use a respirator. We love face shields. So I think if anything good has come out of this pandemic, it has been the emergence of lots and lots of face shields. So a face shield is very effective. First of all, is eye protection primarily. We know that many of these respiratory viruses have quite the affinity for our eyes and that they can follow our lacrimal duct right down into the back of our nose. So we wanna make sure that we're protecting our eyes at all times. And unfortunately, for those of us who wear glasses, it's important to understand that your corrective lenses do not count as eye protection. There's some, been some good research done on face shields, and it indicates that it's, they're very effective at keeping the front of our mask or respirator clean, even when we're in a very close environment or when patients are coughing. So using a face shield, reusing a face shield, making sure it's cleaned in between, you can help reduce the surface contamination of your mask or respirator by 97%. So there are a lot of uh, guidelines out there for the exact donning and doffing steps. Uh, we want to make sure that you're following good protocols, that you're taking things off in an order that makes sense. We like to think of doffing as a dirtiest first operation. So removing, for instance, your gown, your gloves, performing hand hygiene before you have your hands near your face to remove a face shield. And then finally, changing out of your mask or respirator. So before entering a room, we have some very basic steps here. So you're performing hand hygiene, putting on a clean gown or other protective clothing, especially the things that are going to be in contact with a patient or a client's uh, head, chest, and upper arms, where they're more likely to have these droplets that are escaping their mouth. Put on a surgical mask with ties or loops. Put on your eye protection. Put on clean gloves. And then obviously you would be changing gloves if they become torn or heavily contaminated and in entering the patient care area. Eve, sorry, I just took your slide. I'm going to hand it back to you. No problem. Next slide, please. This is again um, something that's new in dentistry. What, it, what it's basically done is it's combined some elements of standard precautions and droplet precautions. And we're really not that familiar with droplet um, and other transmission-based precautions in dentistry. So this is something that um, bears uh, spending some time on. Uh, as Jill said, you know, we have, there's a prescribed sequence that's recommended and um, it should be done before you enter a patient room or treatment area. I know that that's not always possible in every setting, um, so you may have to make some adaptations to these guidelines, but keep in mind the rationale is that um, before you enter a patient room or you have contact with a patient, you've provided the, to the best ability that you can protection for both yourself and the patient. And there are also uh, prescribed guidelines for after you complete the dental care and this is after the patient has been dismissed, you would first remove your gloves and then carefully remove your gown or protective clothing by turning it inside out. So untie it at the neck and untie it at the waist if it's a gown and pull it off um, inside out, careful not to touch the front of the gown with your um, ungloved hands and then discard that in the waste container. I know that it's been typical in dentistry that a gown would be used for multiple patients, but under these precautions, you should be um, discarding the gown after each patient. Collect your cloth gowns if you're using reusable gowns um, to be laundered after use in a designated container. Now you can exit the patient room or the patient care area 
and perform hand hygiene. Now you can touch your eye protection by carefully grabbing either the strap of a face shield or the, um, the, the sidebars of, of a um, protective eyewear. So if you're wearing goggles, and again, I agree that a face shield does provide um, greater benefit than eyeglass or than goggles alone because it can also protect your your mask or your respirator from becoming wet. Uh, if you um, are using a face shield and you like to wear loops, be aware that there are some available that will accommodate your loops. Try them out first though to make sure that they don't angle too far away from your face because that's going to reduce the protective nature of that face shield. You want the face shield to go down past your chin and around the sides of your face to provide the most protection possible. If your uh, eye protection is reusable, follow the manufacturer's instructions for cleaning and disinfecting that. And if it's disposable, discard after each use. Remove and then discard your surgical mask or your respirator, whichever you've been wearing. Um, or if they do need to be reused, you would store them in a breathable container for reuse. And now perform hand hygiene just in case you've accidentally contaminated your hands during the process of removing your PPE. So again, you can see here, uh, this is an oral surgery procedure where they're wearing a face shield that protects their eyes, their mask, and their non-intact skin of the face and neck. And uh, the use of high volume suction, uh, well-placed rubber dam when appropriate, and the use of four-handed dentistry can all help reduce the amount of aerosols that leave the patient's mouth during aerosol generating procedures. And for behavior, remember too, once you've put on your PPE, you shouldn't be touching anything except the patient and patient care equipment. So don't reach into a pocket for a cell phone or adjust your PPE um, or touch your, your face or anything else um, with your gloved hands once you've begun treating the patient. And then if you do need to take a break, your, your um, respirator becomes dislodged or something else, stop the procedure, remove the gloves, perform hand hygiene, and then if you're going to touch anything that may be contaminated, put on clean gloves and do whatever it is that you need to do and then restart the procedure. Also remember that in these days, PPE isn't just for um, uh, patient care. The uh, face masks or uh, cloth face uh, coverings need to be worn as source control in addition to physical distancing. So the picture on the left shows people talking to a front desk person, you know, making an appointment or receiving information, but they're clustered together. So what a lot of people have done now is place clear plexiglass barriers at places where um, people face the public. So if you have public facing personnel, such as receptionists, office managers, and so forth, and they're in an area where they're going to have to talk to patients, Think about if you can put a plastic plexiglass barrier in addition to keeping a, a safe social distance of two meters or six feet. And of course, the um, PPE should always be worn in dentistry. The picture shown here on the right was not appropriate even in the non-COVID era, because as you can see, they're not wearing any face protection. Uh, they're not wearing long sleeves. Uh, and um, even the assistant appears to not be wearing gloves. So this was our pre-infection control era. And I think I haven't seen a dental practice looking like that since uh, the mid 1980s, thankfully. I'll turn that back over to Jill. Yeah, yeah. That's probably when we got that picture was in the mid 1980s, back before we thought there was anything to worry about. So I just want to point out a couple of things that, uh, you know, for many of us, this idea of extended use of personal protective equipment is new. Uh, and it's actually not completely new to this pandemic. Uh, the CDC has had guidelines uh, for many years about extended use of things like N95 respirators. But for most of us, we have been treating them as single use items. And so this is a new process for us. What we mean by extended use is that you can use it um, throughout the course of a single day. But we do want you to be able to remove things carefully, perform hand hygiene, store things where they can be kept clean and dry. Making sure that if you're going to reuse them, they're only reused by you, uh, not being shared with anyone, which is kind of gross anyway. But uh, part of that is 
the idea of well, why can't I just lay it down? If, if I'm the only one working in this room, why can't I just lay it down? And of course, uh, this pandemic has really brought up some very interesting ideas because I think in conventional uh, infection control, we've thought about being able to have our office area or a break room as being a clean area uh, outside any contamination by patients. Uh, and what we have now is this situation where we don't know who among us might be pre-symptomatic. So until we can get to that information, we have to worry that it is us or our coworker who is a pre-symptomatic patient, a pre-symptomatic person who might be shedding virus and not yet have developed any symptoms at all. And therefore, we want to make sure that uh, we're storing things where they can't be contam become contaminated uh, in between uses. So in this case, uh, the picture is with a, a paper gift bag, uh, hanging your mask inside of it so they can air dry, not being sealed up, because uh, certainly they get very moist uh, during use but then being able to remove it without having to come in contact with uh, the mask or the filter material itself. So there are a lot of options for uh, repurposing, uh, re-sterilizing uh, or disinfecting, if you will, uh, masks. Uh, and if that's going to be done, please make sure that that process has been vetted. There have been many, many things. Again, in the great world of Googling things, there are many things that people have have tried uh, in order to reprocess these uh, pieces of personal protective equipment. Not all of them are easy to accomplish, and you want to make sure that you're doing this carefully and appropriately. So, so please do not think that just putting it on the dashboard of your car, uh, please don't microwave things. Uh, there are a lot of methods out there that people are talking about that have not been proven effective. Uh, so if you want to, uh, if you're in a situation where you need to reprocess your PPE, make sure that you're using a process that's been very carefully investigated. Again, thinking about what we've contaminated, we're used to the idea of our, the outside of our PPE being contaminated by clients and patients. And in this case, we also want to worry that the inside of our PPE might be contaminated by ourselves, right? So we don't want it sitting. I don't want to put my mask down where I'm going to contaminate a surface with the, the inside of my mask that's been against my mouth all day. So just making sure that you're keeping these things separated and, again, where they can air dry. Go ahead, Eve. You can talk a little bit more about decontaminating respirators. Sure. Thank you. Um, I think it's also important to point out that um, the, the guidelines that exist for reuse and extended use of PPE um, uh, also caution that this is really for situations such as we find ourselves in where there are uh, critical shortages of PPE due to um, surges of patients in hospitals and also the types of patients such as the ones with COVID-19 who really require a lot more PPE than um, other patients may. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the decontamination of the filtering face piece respirators, such as the N95. The three types that have been identified um, by CDC and that are also contained in some of the OSHA guidances are ultraviolet germicidal irradiation, also called UVGI, uh, vaporous hydrogen peroxide, which is often uh, referred to as VHP, and certain types of moist heat, but not the steam autoclave that many of you have in your dental practices. The CDC also cautions that the um, filtering face piece respirators should not be worn by healthcare providers when they're performing or present for an aerosol generating procedure, um, and that also the KN95s, which have FDA emergency use authorization should not be decontaminated, but should be used as a um, single patient use. So when there's an adequate supply of PPE, um, then it, we can go back to doing uh, single patient use. But as Phil said in the interim, if you're needing to reuse or extend the use of PPE, do that very carefully. And if you accidentally touch the inside of your respirator with your gloved hand so that it may have become contaminated, you need to um, have that either decontaminated appropriately or discard it. We also need to think about how we, um, how we manage our environment. We're pretty good in dentistry, I think, about environmental um, 
uh, decontamination of clinical contact surfaces through cleaning and disinfection. But remember, you also want to avoid things like manually pushing down on the trash. You don't want to aerosolize waste and also you don't want to take the risk of there being some contaminated waste in there that you could accidentally come into contact with. COVID-19 is not necessarily considered uh, regulated medical waste. It uh, should be handled the same way as you handle the rest of your waste. If it becomes saturated with blood or other body fluids, then it probably is a regulated medical waste. Otherwise, it can be discarded with your other non-regulated waste that may be contaminated with smaller amounts of blood or body fluids. And of course, sharps always go into a labeled or appropriate sharps container. Look for cleaning and disinfecting products that list human coronavirus um, on the list of the organisms that they're able to kill. Or you can look up the EPA list of disinfectants. Just do a Google search, EPA disinfectants COVID-19, and you'll see a list that the EPA has approved for use um, as effective against COVID-19. It's not COVID specific, but they're ones that have been found to be um, effective against other organisms that are believed to have the same level of resistance to disinfectants as um, SARS-CoV-2. I would caution you though that um, a lot of those disinfectants are low level. So if you're using an intermediate level disinfectant, meaning that it's tuberculocidal, so it's broad spectrum, you wanna to continue to look for that on the label as well. And in reviewing that list, I see that many of the most commonly used disinfectants in dentistry are already on the EPA list. Make sure, again, that you're following all of the appropriate precautions and that you're following the manufacturer's guidelines for applying the disinfectant. Many disinfectants require that surfaces be pre-cleaned, and that can be done um, either with a disinfectant that also contains a uh, cleaning agent, as many of them do, or you can use two separate products. But most disinfectants do need to be applied to a clean surface, so the surface needs to be pre-cleaned, and then it needs to remain wet for the contact time indicated on the product label. Encourage everybody to do frequent hand hygiene with either alcohol-based hand rubs or soap and water. I will say that having spent many years in infection control, it's been uh, wonderful to see people washing their hands a lot more than they used to. So uh, after, after 30 years of preaching um, uh, to, to wash your hands and, and perform frequent hand hygiene, I think people are finally doing it. Make sure that those hand rubs have a minimum of 70% isopropyl or 60% ethanol. And be careful, don't combine cleaners, either directly or indirectly, say by applying one cleaner, and then while it's still wet, applying another one on top. As certain things can cause, um, uh, you know, can release dangerous uh, gases or vapors. Follow the instructions for or any kind of dilution. And if you're going to aliquot by putting things from a, a, say a large container into multiple smaller containers, do that carefully and properly label it, both with the date and the expiration date when it needs to be discarded and any other label that may be required by the hazard communication rule. And just sort of as a, a, a winding down, um, thinking about how, what are the things that we can do in dental care to reduce risk. And I'm not suggesting that everything that we've talked about here in this webinar today is what everybody should be doing. It's that these are the things that are available, that if you're able to do them and you can layer them on top of each other to reduce the risk, then, then that's what we all need to try to achieve is that we can make multiple layers of safety to help protect ourselves and our patients. Things like following up with patients, a week or two after they've been in for dental treatment, can you check with them on the phone or send them a text to make sure that they haven't had um, any additional symptoms and that they've remained well? Um, ask a patient after, at the end of an appointment to please give us a call. Let us know if you uh, have a positive test or you develop symptoms and may have COVID-19. Um, and you could even see patients in family units if you wanted to. So you can see a, a few more patients if you have patients that have all been sequestered together, say, you know, multiple family members that have been living together and, and are not leaving the home to go to work or do other things, you might be able to bring them in and see them in sequence so that, um, you know, the, uh, the non-clinical areas don't may, maybe don't need to be cleaned quite as often. 
um, and encourage your staff members to continue to um, maintain safe practices outside of work. This is something that we constantly remind our staff and our um, students to do at the dental school is that you know they need to practice all of the things that, that we require they do in the clinical settings in terms of physical distancing, face protection, um, you know, don't make non-essential trips or um, congregate in groups, keep doing that at home. And I think it's helpful if you can have, um, you know, a, a daily quick huddle or, or staff meeting to make sure that these reminders are always part of that so that you're demonstrating this um, commitment to safety for everybody. And also uh, keep track of what testing is going on and remember that um, an antibody test does not imply immunity to COVID-19. They're not sure yet exactly how to interpret an antibody test. And um, also antibodies may not show up for uh, a period of time after a person's been infected. And then a negative screening test such as a PCR can miss early cases and also can um, produce false negatives. Establish really good habits around the PPE use. It's our best line of defense right now. Um, also is cleaning and disinfection to ensure surfaces are safe. And um, you know, we'll all be able to move forward together in a safe way by following these um, guidelines. I won't go into great detail on these resources because uh, within 24 hours or so, this presentation will be available online and you can look these up. But I just wanted to provide that there are some things that are available for you to um, review later in more detail. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Eve and Joe. That was wonderful information. Really quick, we're going to go over some resources also that NETEC can provide. Again, we do have a question function where you can send them to info at NETEC.org. Uh, we continue to build resources, develop online tools, and deliver technical training um, on a daily basis. So please feel free to visit our website or submit a request for technical assistance at netech.org. So really quick, um, there's a couple questions in our little queue. I'm going to pull out as many as we can in the next um, four to five minutes. Um, but the first one I wanted to pitch to Eve was, um, so Mary asked, have dentists or hygienists had a greater than expected rate of COVID-19 infections? You know, it's interesting that you should ask that because that's one of the research projects that we're um, planning to undertake at, at my university because there isn't good information about that. And we would like to know what the prevalence is um, among dental workers compared to the general population. There are some large studies that are underway looking at healthcare workers, but they are they are not um, uh, including dental workers in that. So that's a question that we don't have the answer for right now. Um, there have been no clusters that we're aware of associated um, with dental practice, you know, which would be that, you know, multiple people in the dental office became infected or that multiple patients from a single office. Um, so those are good signs, but we do need more information. Great. Thank you so much. We do have a couple PPE questions. I'll have time for one or two. So I'm going to pitch this one to Jill. Um, Michael asks if you suggest shaving facial hair when talking about face masks. Great question. So a face mask, uh, the, the ones with the ear loops typically, or a surgical mask that might tie behind your ears uh, over the crown of your head, uh, that is not expected to fit tightly. Snug is good enough. You're going to direct most of your air through the filter. Uh, but certainly if you're talking about wearing a tight fitting respirator, then it is imperative that you follow a very amusing CDC guidance for facial hair that's appropriate for using a filtering face piece respirator that fits tightly on your face. It really needs to fit against your skin and not over facial hair. If you think about it in that case, if you're expecting a respirator fit tightly and it's over facial hair, that facial hair is acting as a filter. And that's kind of gross to think about the things that might get trapped in your facial hair. But generally speaking for uh, just a regular surgical mask, uh, you do not have to uh, have a shaved face. Um, and I will throw one more PPE-related question um, at Jill here before we end. Um, there was a question about when you are doffing um, and um, removing the gown within the clinical area. Um, if you've done an aerosol procedure, for example, um, Dr. Omar asks, 
theoretically droplets, droplets can fall on your scrubs and body. Um, and so he's just kind of asking where you should doff um, your clinical, um, in the clinical area versus not clinical area. Sure. No, great question. We do think about these zones. So there is nothing magic about six feet, but what there is, is, uh, and there's some great pictures online of watching droplets leave someone's mouth and how quickly they fall to the ground. And I know there's been other, some other discussion in the chat and in the QA about aerosols. So just to quickly talk about these, um, the closer you are to a client, the more likely you are to be in their droplet zone and the more likely they are to have droplets on their person and around that sort of three foot zone around their heads. Um, it's safest to be behind a client, but certainly in front of them or to the sides, you're likely to be in that uh, fairly heavy droplet zone. So if you can think about doffing your PPE as far outside that zone as possible, greater than six feet if it's possible, or to the back of the client, then those are gonna be the safer areas. Um, as far as aerosolization, we do know that if you are up in a patient's mouth, they're ex inhaling and exhaling through an open mouth, you are likely to be having exposure to aerosols. And there have been some studies that indicate that this pathogen can stay in the atmosphere for some period of time, but we don't know what the infective dose is of this a virus. So at this point, we know that it is not, just from looking at some very basic research, we know that it's not as contagious as some of the other things we think about as being um, airborne aerosol pathogens like measles or chicken pox. Uh, I think we're just about out of time. Uh, we will continue to try to answer some questions. I'm going to turn this back over to, to Amanda to wrap it up. So um, we will continue to try to answer those questions uh, when we post the webinar for those of the ones that we did not get to. Again, um, next slide, Benjamin. If you have questions that we weren't able to um, answer today, please feel free to submit them at info at netech.org. Um, one last thing is if we'd love for you to join us, we are on social media. Um, we are on YouTube. We do have skill videos there. Our e-learning center um, is at courses at netech.org. And again, at the bottom of the screen is things we've already talked about, just as reminders. We'd like to thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you um, very much to Jill and Eve for giving us this wonderful information. We hope everybody has a great afternoon and feel free to tune into our next webinar in our COVID-19 series. Thank you so much.